Hello there. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, welcome to this uh, info session. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to uh, virtually uh, 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 to greet you and uh, tell you a little bit about our Engineers for Exploration program. Uh, so this is uh, a program that uh, started uh, um, probably more than a decade ago now um, with the National Geographic Explorer, Albert Lin. Um, and the goal of the program was to develop technologies for explorers and scientists uh, and uh, other people who do field work. Um, so over the years, um, we've worked with all kinds of different organizations. You'll, you'll see some of these projects today. Um, but we've worked with uh, National Geographic, we've worked with the Scripps Institutional Oceanography here at UCSD, we've worked with the San Diego Zoo, uh, we've worked with uh, uh, some archaeologists uh, from UT Austin, uh, and just a number of people that I'm, I'm just probably going to blank on here. Uh, but the goal of these, uh, these projects are to, um, to have students like yourselves um, develop technologies for these, these scientists. Um, so these scientists come to us with, with their problems, um, their, their issues, the challenges that they have in, in, um, in their field work. And uh, we, we build systems typically from scratch uh, to, uh, to help them with their, uh, with their, their scientific endeavors. Uh, so it's been uh, a lot of fun. Uh, we've had a large number of expeditions uh, with the scientists uh, all over the all over the world. Um, so uh, Guatemala, Mexico, many islands in the Caribbean. Uh, some of our earliest explorers went to Mongolia. Um, also Belize. I think that picture showing Kurt, my other co-director there, is is from Belize. Um, so it's been uh, just tremendous uh, uh, fun and opportunity for. Uh, you um, to take your skills that you're learning in, in your classes and use them for real world applications. Um, and so the uh, goal of today's info session uh, is to, uh, to show you some of the projects that we have ongoing this year. Um, we are open um, to anybody that is dedicated and then willing to put in time um, in any field. And so we've had students from across engineering, from across campus, oceanographers, data scientists, electrical engineers, computer scientists, you name it, we've pretty much had it in our program. Um, we don't expect you to necessarily have all the skills, but we expect you to try to learn all of those skills uh, and do so while you're uh, working to deploy these technologies um, with these scientists in the field. So I think we probably have about five to 10 different projects that we'll be going through today. Uh, the way that the program is organized, um, we typically have around 50 students at any given time working on the various projects. Um, and we have uh, project leads. Um, so those project leads or the subset of those project leads will be presenting today. They'll be telling you, giving you an overview about the project. Uh, and then those project leads um, take a team of students, uh, sometimes five, 10 or more students and uh, uh, work on them uh, with our collaborators and with uh, Nathan, who is our, our uh, R&D engineer and uh, with other professors in, 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 at UCSD and other places to, uh, uh, to design, prototype and deploy these, these technologies. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of those projects here. Thank you, Nathan, uh, for showing, for showing uh, the, the different types of projects. You can see that the, uh, the projects are, are quite broad. Um, and quite uh, unique, but the, the kind of common theme is that we will uh, be developing these systems, software, hardware, mechanical systems, um, in order to, uh, for a purpose, in order to do something for, for our scientific partners. Um, there is an application process that I'm guessing we're going to go through later, um, but I think for now, um, just, uh, just uh, have a sit back and, and kind of just listen to the different projects and see what interests you. The most important aspect of being a successful uh, engineers for exploration uh, researcher is that you are um, really dedicated. And most of the time we're going to be really dedicated to the things that interest us. And so if something really catches your eye, then uh, I think you, and you really wanna do that, then you are a great candidate for that project. Now, the projects will also tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, so what sort of skills that you need for those projects. And again, that's um, something that you can learn if you're willing to put the time in. Um, but if you have those skills and you're you know, deciding between a number of different projects, because uh, honestly, all the projects are really cool. 
uh, then you know maybe go for the project that is uh, most interesting or that, that best fits your skill sets or best fits the skills that you would like to learn. Okay, so uh, I've talked way more than I should have. Um, I think we should go into the projects now and uh, feel free to uh, chat, uh, ask questions in the chat if you have, and we'll, we'll have some time at the end to uh, definitely answer any sort of questions that you may have. So let's get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Miyamoto. I'm one of the co-leads for the II sleep monitoring team. Um, one of my other co-leads, Amay, he unfortunately could not make it because he's, I think, flying into San Diego like right now. But I will walk us through what we do for our team. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Nathan? Thank you. Okay. So IIs, they are an endangered species of lemur native to the Mad Madagascar. And um, I'll go more in depth about it, but we work in collaboration with the San Diego Zoo. And so we're building a network of sensors to um, pretty much observe the II sleep and um, hopefully find any disturbances in their sleep. So the IIs that we're working with are at the San Diego Zoo. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so we have a sensor of networks composed of an IMU or an inertial, inertial measurement unit. So we use it to gather accelerometer or gyroscopic data. We have two video or two cameras to capture video for us and then two microphones. Um, and we hope to be able to like analyze all this data and then um, like conclude binary states of sleep for the IIs. So whether they're sleeping well or not sleeping well. And then this data will be handed off to like ecologists that work at the zoo that um, watch over the IIs to make sure that like they're getting good sleep. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So network specs include hardware. So we have a Pi IR camera and we also have IP cameras or one IP camera, which you can see on the screen in the pictures. Um, the inertial sensor that we have is an Arduino Nano DLE Sense. And then we also have two microphones. Um, if you look on the picture at the top left, that whole like mirage of cables has um, a USB sound card and microphone in there. Um, and you can see the Raspberry Pi and a housing unit that we have for the nesting box, which I'll explain later. <laughs> and for the software, we are using computer vision um, to analyze the videos that we get. And we also are going to look into like vibration and audio analysis. Um, and so this network of sensors also is not like a wearable device for the IIs. We are like strategically placing them in the II enclosures. Um, so it's not invasive at all. And for deployment wise, we are trying to do an initial trial at the lab at the San Diego Zoo within the next few weeks. And then after that, we'll be deploying to the II enclosures. And so like the progress of this um, project so far is like each member of our team works on individual components. And then right now we're trying to like integrate it all into a succinct um, network. But we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just an overview of the system again. Um, you can see the data server and the router and um, this a remote sensor unit and the nesting box unit. And so the remote sensor unit has the IP camera, which we'll use to play to um, see like the overall um, enclosure of the IIs to see like their activity besides just their sleep. Um, whereas the nesting box unit has all these sensors that we place on top of the box that the IIs sleep in. And that's um, to you know, observe the actual sleep. And if there's any disturbances from their sleep, hopefully we could see activities from the remote sensor unit possibly um, in their larger enclosure. But we can go to the next slide. So the goals are to like complete the integration of the sensors into the network, continue analyzing um, like test data that we have. And then also um, the main skill set that we're looking for this quarter is um, someone to update our web interface. Right now, um, I just use Dash, which is a Python framework, and it's written on top of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But if you're someone who's really into web dev and you want to make our web interface very um, pretty, it would be very cool. Um, so we originally had a TFT screen, which you see on the left. And the point of this uh, whole like component of our project is so that um, zookeepers can help us monitor the system once it is deployed. So 
The idea of the screen was just to have it running 24 seven and a zookeeper can walk by and check the system, check the timestamps, make sure the video feed's working, uh, make sure our peripherals are connected properly. But um, like due to like hardware design, it kind of became an issue with like mounting the screen onto the um, nesting box. So instead we just focused on creating a web interface, which would be easier and it takes away like the hardware difficulties that we're having. Um, we can go to the next slide. So yeah, the skills we need is just a web developer. Um, you don't have to use Dash. That was just like a tool that was really easy for me to use. Like Ryan had mentioned, I'm an EE. I did not do web development ever in my life before. So I just used Dash, which was really easy for me to like learn web dev very quickly. But we would love someone who actually is really interested and um, has a passion for web development. So um, on the screen, we have May and my contact info, and then also Nathan's. Um, and if you have any like questions, I'll be in the Zoom call still, so you can like direct message me if you have any immediate questions. But yeah, please like email us if you have any questions or you just want to talk and hear more about the project. But that's all from us. Thank you. Have a great week one. <laughs>
um, for publications. And I um, already mentioned, uh, we have a VR application. Next slide. Yeah, so um, what you see here is kind of um, a bowl that was scanned using structure for motion um, that we've added. And um, there's these floating spheres throughout this excavation. This is um, a place we've gone many times every summer. Um, and you don't actually hear it, but our collaborator, Tom Garrison, is actually explaining kind of what, where you're at. You're in front of a tomb where they discovered that bowl. And so that's kind of what we've, we've fleshed out in these last few years is uh, kind of a mobile VR application. Next slide. And so uh, going forward, um, you know, uh, Unreal Engine is going to be releasing uh, their next version, Unreal Engine 5, later this year. And that's very exciting because um, kind of earlier how I talked about how you need to optimize things um, so they can run real time. Well, once this technology comes out, we can actually take the kind of raw, unprocessed, unoptimized data and just put it into the game engine. And it's going to look uh, amazing. Um, all this detail on it, you can even. Um, um, next slide. And so we have a lot of data of, of like taken from different um, places. This is an image of a point cloud that was taken on um, an aerial LIDAR scan where they removed the trees and you can create a mesh, um, you can mesh it out and you can kind of classify, maybe put it through like machine learning um, to kind of um, create this color map that you can kind of generate for, um, this world, this huge world um, and spawn things where they need to be based off that classification. And so I highlighted are these kind of locations where we have more um, on ground scan data, like inside of the excavation around it and um, you know, on top of that, you sit on top of this LiDAR scan. And if you go to the next slide, um, now with Unreal Engine, the Cesium for Unreal plugin, you get this kind of Google Earth-like easily, um, to Google Earth-like interface to easily even place all that high, high uh, detail, high detail virtual worlds on top of the globe. And so that's kind of a prototype you see there where you can really flesh out this uh, accurate uh, model of these locations and um, visualize it on top of it. So uh, next slide. And so the, the goal is to kind of create these um, for public outreach to maybe we can have a cave kiosk in a museum in Guatemala or in the US make this accessible through the Steam store or on your VR headsets. And these are kind of the, the platforms you would use to do that, right? These kind of goggles that are um, getting smaller and smaller and better every year and uh, these cave kiosk devices. Next slide. And so traditionally, um, people who have uh, um, were able to kind of uh, get the most out of this project have already had like a uh, game development background. Um, so whether that's building virtual worlds or programming something in Unity or Unreal, um, usually if you've had that experience already, then um, it's really easy to kind of uh, jump on. But if not, then it's kind of like a lot of uh, dedication um, and time to kind of pick up on this kind of skill because it's different from um, other computer science disciplines, I think, more creative. Um, so yeah, reach out to me if you're interested. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mia, and I'm the current project lead for the Radio Telemetry Tracking Project. And uh, I'll be giving a brief overview of our project and some upcoming goals. Uh, next slide. So uh, for a bit of background on the motivation for this project, uh, tracking animals with radio telemetry is a common practice, but traditional methods of tracking on foot take a lot of time and physical effort, um, especially when navigating through dense foliage. In this photo here, you can get a bit of an example by um, looking at just how tall those bushes are compared to the researchers and um, the Antenna is a directional antenna, meaning that it'll start picking up a signal from a transmitter if it exists in the direction the, the antenna is pointing. 
So uh, if that animal happens to be in the direction of those tall bushes, then they would have to make it through all of those large dry plants to make it to the target animal. Um, next slide. So to find a more efficient way to track transmitters on animals, this project was created in 2013 as a collaboration with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Um, and the goal was to create a drone-based solution for tracking animals. Um, in addition to our um, original collaboration with the San Diego Zoo, we are currently working on collaborations with um, Gus Caldron at Airspace Consulting, which is a company that specializes in building drones, um, and the LA Zoo, as well as uh, Dr. Gifford at the University of Central Arkansas, which is um, who is interested in tracking common collared lizards. Uh, next slide. So um, to explain a bit how our current system works, um, which is the drone system, uh, we have a drone fly over a specified area in a pattern like the one you see in the left image. It's like a lawnmower pattern. Um, and as it goes along its flight, it is continuously collecting data and using that to calculate where the transmitter is estimated to be and how precise that estimate is um, in real time. On the right here, we have a photo of our UI after a simulated flight where each of the circle symbols represents a ping received from the transmitter. And the strongest pings are colored red while the weakest pings are colored blue. Um, and that diamond symbol in the center, if you could see it, I know the image is a bit small, um, represents our like estimate location. So um, next slide. And to give a uh, sort of a breakdown of some of the components in this system, um, here's a systems diagram of our current system. So um, quick summary of parts and what they do. We have an upcore for our onboard computer, and this part is responsible for processing and storing collected data and facilitating communication with um, the UI board and the ground control station. Uh, the UI board is responsible for displaying system statuses of um, the different components, as well as uh, collecting information from the GPS and compass. Uh, the ground control station, which the user interacts with, is responsible for communication with the drone, as well as using collected data to calculate the estimate location, as well as display the collected data and the results of those calculations. Um, next slide. So to go into some of our goals for this year, um, as I mentioned before, we have um, a potential Arkansas deployment uh, with Dr. Gifford. And uh, the problem to be solved is that we have um, a fixed area. It's about, uh, I think, 120 by five to 600 meters. Um, and we want to track where the lizards move over this area um, with results desired every 10 minutes. Um, Specifically, I believe they want to track where the lizards are in reference to the temperature of the area they're in over the course of a few days. So because these results are desired so frequently over a longer period of time, a drone really isn't a feasible solution due to time and battery constraints. So our current plan solution is to use a system of fixed towers that will monitor the area. Um, because of changes in the system, we will likely need adjustments to our user interface to be able to account for receiving data from multiple systems. Um, in addition to this, uh, though work on our UI board is expected to be mostly complete, we still need to test what's existing already and make sure that's running smoothly, as well as build and test the physical towers. Um, next slide. Uh, at the moment, we are also working on a collaboration with Airspace Consulting and the LA Zoo who want to track pandas in Chengdu, China. Um, they currently have an existing tracking system and have requested help with data visual visualizations. So uh, we plan to uh, make adjustments to our UI to, make, to meet their needs. And in addition to this, we are planning on testing our current system on um, the Panda drone. 
So um, on the right, you can see the panda collar as well as the drone. Um, and in addition to this, we have a potential deployment opportunity this upcoming summer for tracking iguanas in the Turks and Caicos Islands. That will also be a drone deployment. So in order to make that happen, we need to do um, the system testing to ensure everything works and that we're flight ready. Uh, next slide. All right, so uh, here I've summarized uh, more immediate work to be done as well as some of the skills involved in them. Um, if you are interested or have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through my email. Um, yeah, I believe that is all for us. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Parth. I'm one of the co-leads for Burning Owls, and I have my other co-lead here as well, Bill. And this is just a bit of our project. Uh, next slide, please. So the motivation behind this project is we work in collaboration with researchers at the San Diego Zoo to basically help determine characteristics about Burring Owls. They've been seeing a population drop in a lot of the recent years, and it's obviously a big concern. And our point of this project is to basically help classify the pictures set off by uh, camera traps they have in the environments there, because those camera traps can obviously collect a lot of photos if it's set off by a, um, a non owl animal or something for that instance. So our motivation is to help reduce that workload and sort the images through our pipeline. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you for. Yeah, so let's take a look at the general overview of our pipeline. Um, the first step is to gather the data, in our case, the pictures. Uh, we mainly get our pictures from the camp trap, like Perth mentioned in the field from the zoo. Uh, and this may involve uh, many other uh, animals. So the next step is to detect and crop the relevant part of the image that we think it is interesting. Uh, instead of doing the classification on the whole image, we crop the bigger image into smaller interesting pieces and do the classification on those smaller pieces. We believe this helps us to uh, increase the accuracy of the model and makes, makes the model more flexible to other tasks, uh, tasks like counting owls. Um, the current model we are using for detecting and crop is uh, mega detector. The next step, as mentioned before, is to do the classification on this smaller pieces. For now, we're able to detect owls and unknown owls in the image with a decent accuracy. Um, Parth will continue to elaborate our current classification benchmarks. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so just to give a little number overview on this project. So this project is primarily uh, computer vision and machine learning, but the data we received, if anyone has experience in it, in order to get a good model for classification, you obviously need a good data set. But in our, in this project, we have a lot of biased data set towards non-OWL. So we emphasize a greater need for model architecture or data augmentation. So recently throughout this past year, through a lot of great work and collaboration with our team, we were able to get about 70 overall and 95% accuracy. But the main thing is for the precision for an owl, we got that up to about 67 to 70%, which is great because considering that we don't have a lot of owl data to begin with, it's a lot of a, the surrounding environment. So trying to figure out how to really extract those features has been a crucial part and something that we've worked on this past year and we'll also be working on this coming year. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, so our goals of the of this attempt here is to refining like the documentation and pipelines, prototyping more integrated model architecture and achieve multi-class classification. Uh, for the next four quarter, we mainly focus on the first goal, which is refining the documentation pipeline. This includes formalize the details of the pipeline, complete and extend the current documentation, and formalize uh, the onboarding details. We hope this groundwork will help us in the future. Uh, 
Um, another goal is to reconstruct our current separated models into one integrated end-to-end -end model. Um, some examples is YOLO and Foster RCNN. This allows us to implement more customization um, compared to involving one black box but a mega detector models. And this in return potentially give, 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 gives a boom in terms of accuracy and other measuring metrics. Um, and this also help us to create a more integrated pipeline instead of two isolated uh, steps. Um, this process may also involve to reconstruct the database. Uh, so this could be more uh, time consuming. And the last objective is to achieve uh, other multi-class classification other than ours. Um, we believe with the flexibility of the new integrated model, this is a relatively easy, easy way to implement because we have already other images in our data set. Yeah, next slide, please. So yeah, so a lot of the skills we are looking for in this project have to do obviously with machine learning and computer vision. For example, that's primarily for our classification and de detection part, but also for example, Python, just to have the script to run the actual pipeline itself to go from basically a folder of images to our filter data set. But at the same time, we're open to anyone. So if you don't particularly have experience in that, but you want to learn or stuff, we're it would be an awesome experience in our opinion, as long as obviously there's dedication and passion, we think it'll be a great fit. And then just a quick little side note, the main thing is um, we won't be recruiting for fall quarter, but we will be recruiting for winter and spring. But if you guys do have any questions, feel free to contact either me or Bill whenever on Slack, email or whichever works. But yeah, thank you guys. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me? Fine. Yeah, yes. Right, thanks. Um, so my name is Jacob Ayers. I am the current project lead for the Automated Acoustic Species Identification Project, uh, which is a collab one, another collaboration between San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, specifically uh, their population sustainability researchers and uh, our eFree lab. So on to the next slide. Uh, so for some context for this project is uh, basically right now we're in the middle of what is referred to as the Anthropocene, where uh, we are in the midst of a very mass extinction. Um, it's not always immediately apparent because it's extrapolated over a long period of time with respect to our lifespans and uh, across you know the entire globe. And so this has very much motivated a demand for uh, a lot of new technologies to monitor uh, biodiversity across various different ecosystems. So onto the next slide. Uh, so many uh, techniques that were used to monitor biodiversity in the past uh, have difficulty scaling. Uh, essentially, uh, you can do things like track, uh, look at animal tracks and you know that you know this species uh, occurred approximately at this time. You can look at feeding sites and look at the trends over time or on a year to year basis, or you can catch and release. And so some of these are very invasive, some of them are less so, um, but uh, fail to account for many species as well. So onto the next slide. So kind of moving into the modern era, uh, new technologies are being adopted that uh, in, use a lot, you know, that it, take advantage of machine learning. Uh, and so one common uh, technique used by our San Diego Zoo collaborators in the past has, uh, to great success, has been deploying camera trap arrays. Um, and so what you're essentially doing is you're taking these massive image data sets that would be very challenging to label by hand, and you use artificial intelligence to kind of parse through and, uh, and classify those images. And if you get those reliable enough, what you do is you can uh, start deriving population density estimates from these images. Um, and so unfortunately, um, camera traps uh, can be slightly invasive uh, because oftentimes they have to clear uh, a view angle. So if you're in a dense uh, tropical rainforest, you can't just have a bunch of leaves covering your camera trap. And, um, and they also have a lot of points of failure, right? Um, because they have like IR sensors, they have the camera and um, among other things. So onto the next slide. 
So that kind of comes into the domain that this project lies in called passive acoustic monitoring. And the idea here is that you deploy a lot of low cost audio recorders over an ecosystem to record sounds and you use similar technologies uh, used in image classification on camera traps or sound classification on uh, audio that has been converted basically into an image. Uh, I won't go into the nitty gritty details there necessarily, but um, th the idea here is that we can monitor a lot of different indicator species that can judge how well or how healthy an ecosystem is. And, um, and it just provides us access to a lot of species that were historically very challenging to monitor to a statistically significant amount, right? It's very easy. Well, not, I'm not going to say very easy, but it's easy to set up a camera trap to track jaguars. It's very hard to set up a camera trap to trap uh, to capture cicadas. Um, however, cicadas are very small and very noisy, most importantly, very noisy. And so uh, our audio arrays are able to collect that and we use machine learning and digital signal processing to go through these massive audio sets and classify the sounds. So uh, into the next slide. So um, one of the motivations for this project was that our San Diego Zoo collaborators went out and deployed uh, these microcontroller-like devices called AudioMOS, which are about the size of um, three AA batteries in a row. And uh, they deployed 35 of these in the Peruvian Amazon, and they basically unloaded that data set onto us and said, see what you can find in here. Um, and so uh, that's one massive data set that we have access to. And I'll also note that it was um, they recorded at 384 kilohertz sampling rate. So they have sounds way outside the human hearing range, which cuts off at about uh, 22 kHz. So, um, and it's about 1500 hours of audio data. So no human can possibly sit down, listen to all that audio and classify it um, well. And so machine learning is a natural choice. So let's go on into the next slide. Uh, as this project has expanded, E3 has uh, now garnered capabilities to do our own uh, audio array deployments. And so uh, two weeks over August, just you know, last month, we deployed um, 10 audio recorders on the Scripps Coastal Reserve right down the street from uh, UCSD. And, um, and so this is just another data set that we had. We used the exact same settings that our collaborators used. and um, and yeah, collected about 300 hours worth of audio. Uh, and we looked at this place, A, because we wanted to get familiar with the hardware, and B, uh, there are some endangered species in the, uh, that are known to exist in this area. So uh, next slide. So uh, I just want to give a brief outline of the fall 2021 project goals. These uh, <laughs> likely uh, will deviate uh, you know, from beginning to end of fall, but uh, it get, kind of gives an idea of what we're working on. So right now we have what we refer to as a human audio labeling system, where we have volunteers go and label audio data that we have collected and uploaded onto a system called PyroNote. Um, and we have what is referred to as the automated audio labeling system called PyHawk, which is just a Python package that is used to encapsulate a lot of the different techniques we've used to parse through these massive audio sets. Um, another goal is to do another audio moth deployment similar to the one we did at Scripps Coastal Reserve, but at the Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve, uh, which is just located in Mission Bay and has a lot of similar species to uh, Scripps. Um, yeah, on to the next slide. So this slide is just sort of a search, trying, trying to be catch all. Basically, if you're interested in any of these things, you should consider this project. Um, but it's also a lot of skills we are actively uh, working for. So Python, we have written a Python package. Python's used in pretty much every single project at E3. So that's, you know, Python, Python, Python. Um, is very useful to have DSP skills, digital signal processing, because uh, a lot of the work we do is just manipulating audio signals, um, which is, you know, very grounded in DSP. Uh, machine learning, uh, if you're interested in deep learning, we use uh, hybrid CNN RNN models. So any knowledge there is super helpful. We're looking into kind of post-processing some data using uh, support vector machines. Um, and then, yeah, I say data pre-post-processing. It's like 
you know, you're looking at predictions, what do you do with those predictions? Um, and also like, how do you do like audio manipulation and among other things. Uh, for PyreNote, we need a lot of web development skills constantly. Um, you can actually, uh, I'll provide a link after, um, but you can actually go onto our website um, and start playing around with our interface. Uh, and in general, uh, if you're interested in ecology, biology, zoology, or have prior skills in those fields, we are very interested um, in your skill set. So uh, next slide, or I believe that might be my last slide. So uh, if this project interests you, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I also have posted our relevant GitHub repositories. Uh, you can also check out our collaborators. So yeah, uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to message me in the chat. Thank you. everyone. Thank you, Jacob, for that. Um, I'm Dylan Hicks. I am a second year master's student and the current lead of the Mangrove Monitoring Project. Um, so next slide. So uh, a main question that really pops up when we're, oh, let me turn up my microphone volume, actually. Um, let's see. Okay, so es essentially what are mangroves? So mangroves are a uh, really important type of tree species that live on the coast of tropical areas in pretty much all around the world. So they typically live in brackish water directly on the coast and are home to a massive amount of ecosystems and, you know, of course, helping stop global warming. So next slide. So, of course, the main benefits of why this project is focused on mangroves is kind of fourfold. So, of course, carbon sequestration. So mangroves are uh, really efficient at absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and from their environment. So um, almost twice as much CO2 in their roots and their actual soil system when compared to tropical rainforests per area. So they're incredibly productive, even though these ecosystems are relatively small in size, um, you know, they're really potent in what they do. Um, in addition, uh, protection from tropical storms. So we can see areas all across the world being battered by the increase, uh, increasity of intensity of uh, tropical storms. For example, in areas like New Orleans, where wetlands are constantly eroding away, mangroves can act essentially as a sponge against these, uh, um, these really strong hurricanes and cyclones, et cetera. Um, also, um, mangroves essentially act, act as a fish, uh, a breadbasket for a lot of the fisheries around these tropical areas. And of course, because of all these reasons, you know, fisheries, uh, protecting the coast, um, these mangroves are super high value in terms of actual, you know, their monetary value up to $57,000 per hectare. Next slide. So of course, what we do to actually protect and help conserve these mangroves is uh, three different ways. So of course, data acquisition. So a lot of what our, what our group does is actually using drones to take high resolution images of these mangrove ecosystems, allowing us to get really high detail imagery um, you know, for our machine learning workflow. So before we've actually gone out and recorded massive amount of data, uh, image data in areas like Baja, California, and soon Jamaica uh, for our machine learning workflows. Um, which of course are used to get classifications for these mangrove ecosystems. So if you can see that image on the bottom right, uh, that's actually an image classification of you know, these mangrove ecosystems. And this is used to tell really how many mangroves are in an ecosystem and therefore what is their worth. And also um, making tools for scientists. So using these machine learning workflows to actually develop tools that not only us as engineers can use, but also, you know, uh, biologists and uh, other conservationists can use to help protect mangroves. So next slide. So of course, the main part of what we do is machine learning development. So, you know, in order to track how well mangroves are doing, or even to track quite, quite the opposite, how poorly they're doing, uh, we need to develop state-of-the-art machine learning workflows to classify and tell where these mangroves are and how many there are. Um, 
one of the main ways we do that is, of course, you know, our classification workflows. We're typically using uh, pretty state-of-the-art models and hybrid models to do these. Um, so if you can see that top image um, is kind of the type of transformation that we'll do. Uh, we'll take an input image, in this case, a satellite image, and, you know, of course, uh, get an output classification telling us how many mangroves are there. And then below, of course, a uh, super resolution. So that's one thing that we, we mainly do um, to kind of stretch our data. Um, so a lot of the time we're using multiple data sources, not only drone imagery, but also satellite imagery. So we use super resolution to up the resolution of our satellite imagery to combine it all together um, to, of course, make a performant model. And of course, uh, one of the the, the main skills that we need for this are, you know, deep learning libraries. Of course, a lot of what we do is with uh, deep neural networks and data science libraries. So working a lot with, uh, you know, scikit-learn, pandas, the, the standard data science workflow. And of course, you know, machine learning, uh, I think we kind of, someone discussed this earlier, but Python is obviously a given for that, um, especially in the data science world. Next slide. And also to get on the tools that we use to help scientists, one of the main ones uh, that we've been developing is ML Paint. Um, so, in order to get our classification uh, classification pipelines, as we discussed before, we of course need really good label data, and this is very hard to do. Um, so. Uh, in the past, we've been developing this, this application, ML Paint, uh, which is actually an assistive labeling tool to use machine learning to actually make it way easier and way faster to uh, get this, this, this label data. So, of course, we use Java to develop this, but, of course, exposure to ML would be really helpful in knowing uh, what's going on. But uh, we hope to publish a paper and develop studies and just kind of wrap up things with, with, with this application. Um, so any help would be greatly appreciated. Next slide. And also lastly, one of the main ways that we want to actually use our machine learning models is not just for you know, us to be able to um, develop visualizations. For engineers, it's super easy to you know, start a Python script, go into the command line, give it a few arguments, and output is, is what we want. But for a lot of people, that's honestly <laughs> really hard and requires a lot of technical skills. So we want to make it as easy as possible for scientists to, of course, get classifications of, you know, how many and where are the mangroves um, without knowing any technical skills. So of course, uh, this requires a lot of Python web dev to uh, go in with our Python machine learning. So of course, we use Flask and Dash for this. And also, we hope to finally integrate this with um, you know, actual graphics cards processing and not using uh, CPU-based um, processing. So, of course, uh, if you're familiar with cloud computing, so say Azure and Heroku, uh, that would also be really greatly appreciated. So, next slide. Yeah, so just as a conclusion, uh, I'm Dylan. Feel free to contact me if you have any uh, questions about this project. And uh, these are the skills that we would really like uh, for this project. But in reality, I th I'd say the most important skill is, of course, uh, dedication. I'd say dedication goes a lot further than, you know, um, how well you can, you can code something. Um, so yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for, for see, seeing our presentation. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Valley, and I'm one of the team members of SmartPen here at E4E. And um, my project lead, Nick, couldn't be here today because he has a class conflict. So I can tell you guys what our project's about. So we can go to the next slide. All right. So basically, uh, the project over overview and what a SmartPen is SmartPen is a long word surf forward fin that uh, is capable of gathering a lot of data through its sensors. Uh, for example, whether it is in water or not, and it can tell us the temperature of the water it's in, the specific location, and also um, IMU data, such as acceleration and gyroscope. And ultimately, our goal is to use these sensors to be able to produce uh, information such as wave height. And um, I guess the motivation and the reasoning behind the need for a smart fin is there's not that many buoys um, you know, near coastal areas to give us sufficient and accurate data about our coastal environment. So using citizen science and being able to use a smart fin with surfers can provide us with a lot of data in near coastal areas and provide us a better understanding of our environment. So you can go to the next slide. 
So some of the real world applications of our smart bin is, uh, like I said, gather denser data from many beaches and coastal environments and provide more accurate wave height and water temperature forecasts. And along with that, um, we can also find out when, where, and how long people are surfing as well. And we can also potentially find more uses for our smart bin in the future. Go to the next slide. So currently what we have been focusing on is uh, common filters because our smart bin provides um, inertial data from our IMU and we're trying to get the position data of our smart bin. Uh, however, simple double integration can introduce a lot of noise. And like I mentioned earlier, since this is a citizen science project that can also introduce a lot of noise into our projects. So right now we're working on a noise reduction filter. So we're, uh, we decided on using common filters and common smoothing to provide a better estimate of our uh, inertial sensor data and reduce noise ultimately. So you can go to the next slide, please. And our fall plans, our, our plans for this quarter are basically, we have a basic skeleton code and we have an idea of how we want it to work, but we have to build on that and get a working model by the end of this quarter. And we also have to include a lot of noise, noise adjustment matrices, which we have to factor in after you know running water experiments and calibrating data from our bin. And we also have to focus on testing, which can be done through the closure and you know, checking with our other senses, such as the GPS readings. And after working on getting a working Kalman filter algorithm, we're also thinking we could um, top that off with a common smoothing algorithm to get better uh, estimates of our data. So we can go to the next slide. And another thing that we're working on, which is to go from the position data that we can get from the Kalman filters is we're working on spectrum analysis to determine the wave height from our acceleration data, which is the ultimate goal of the project. So spectral analysis basically uses information about how power is distributed by analyzing the frequency domain of our functions. So with our common filter data, we will get the vertical displacement of the smart bin, and that will be input into our spectral analysis algorithms, which should provide us with our wave height. So we are looking into Fourier transforms and how we can use, you know, different sign functions to get like, you know, better wave height measurement. So you can go to the next slide. So basically the ultimate skill sets we need for what we're trying to accomplish this quarter with regards to common filters, we need people that are familiar with data analysis and, you know, that are familiar with Bayesian filters, such as like common filters, particle filters, or any other noise reduction filters. And we also want people that are familiar with Python packages specifically related to data analysis, such as NumPy or FilterPy and other things. And uh, with regards to our spectral analysis algorithm, we want people that are familiar with Fourier transforms and obviously Python and people who are able to uh, implement that into, you know, the Jupyter notebooks and all that. So if you, you know, have any questions or interested or in joining, um, please contact Nick, who is the project lead, and that is his email right there. So, yeah. Hello, I, my name's Chris Crutchfield, and I am the, uh, pro the student lead for the Baboons on the Move project. So go to the next slide. So I'm going to play, I'm going to play the video. So we're, this project seeks to be able to uh, track baboons using cameras on the plains of Kenya and potentially a few other locations um, to kind of give some idea of scale and size of the baboons. These baboons are about, uh, they, they are about, um, hip tall so so uh they they are very very well camouflaged and hard and hard to track and kind of the reason that we'd be or that we'd be interested in tracking these is to kind of understand how such a large group of animals there's more than 160 in this particular troop uh kind of how they make uh collective decisions so um, if you go into the next slide, I have a video from um, 
from one of our collaborators. So before you play the, this video here, um, or maybe play it and then pause it really quick, just so that it become, hopefully gets a little bit more sharp. So kind of want everyone to, to try to see if they can pick out baboons here on, on the screen. Uh, kind of challenge yourself, see how many you can pick out. And in a moment here, when we play the video, I want, I want to know how, how accurate you were. So go ahead and play it. So as you guys are anything like me, um, I find it very hard to identify the baboons without them moving. And this kind of underlines the crux of this project. How do we take this video or in videos like it and collect and identify the baboons here without, without, without having uh, much kind of data to go off of? There, the signal here produces lot, lots of, has lots of noise in it and it, and without that movement it becomes kind of hard. So um, if we can, can go ahead and go to the next slide. Just kind of want to show where we're at and then I'm going to kind of talk about how we do it and then finally kind of what we're looking for. So go ahead and play this. So I'm not going to play, we're not going to play too much of this, but just kind of want to see what we're currently able to pick out. So these are, these this is a mask that is the same video and is an attempt to pick out baboons from, from the last footage. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So the question is, how do we do this? So the first thing is we kind of need to bring the, the a, a certain number of frames into the, into the same coordinate state, uh, coordinate space. I believe we're currently using eight. The way we do that is we find common features. We, map, we then match those features, estimate transformation matrix using ransack, and then apply that transformation uh, using uh, interpolation to allow for some pixel accuracy. And um, each of the next four slides are just gonna be kind of images to go with that. So if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So this here is, a, is some examples of features that we might pick out. Um, you can tell that even though the frames are rotated that we're just able to pick out the same features. If you're gonna to go to the next slide. We then can calculate the, uh, which features match up with which features. And then by basically trying a bunch of transformation matrix, matrices on the, uh, if you could go to the next slide. Um, by trying a bunch of transformation matrices of this form, we can we can make our best kind of guess on what what they are. So I'm not going to go ahead and do the ransack demo. Uh, if you guys are interested, I can do that at a later point. But for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip the demo. Um, so the result is that we're able to kind of twist twist and maybe transform slightly the uh, in, the frame to be able to kind of make sure that that you know rocks in the frame and everything just line up so uh which allows us to do kind of our next thing if you go to the next slide i've got another really short video here um basically what we do is we take say in number of frames in this case four we, we combine them by kind of intersecting the two to create three uh to create th three like potential backgrounds the idea here is that hopefully these three backgrounds have have diff slightly different representations of, of the background. So these baboons might, you might be missing more different portions of the background. And then you can union the three together to hopefully get a fairly complete uh, representation of what has changed uh, the background so that you can compare that against the current, the current frame and calculate what has changed. So at the heart of it, this, this algorithm is primarily focused on change. So which kind of comes into the next couple of things that, that, that this team is looking to work on. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so kind of projects for the upcoming quarter uh, is, uh, the algorithm at this point is fairly, you know, it, it's fairly usable, but our researchers don't have a good way to call it. So we'd like to build a, a GUI. I'm thinking probably something in C-sharp, Java, or maybe TypeScript if we go elect uh, electron, um, and then some familiarity to be able to call um, either the Python code or the C++ code. Uh, I'd like to improve the metrics. So my, my primary priority is the GUI. The metrics are kind of a nice app. I'd like to improve the metrics uh, website so I can kind of, so I can view changes and so, such over time. Um, 
at that I'm kind of looking for maybe like TypeScript or JavaScript, CSS, or one of its one of the like preprocessed languages, and HTML. Um, so if you have some familiarity with with the website design, this might be a good place for you, uh, as are other projects you've already seen. So next slide. Um, the other thing is I have a bunch of stuck code from from working over the summer that I kind of need to massage to kind of to fit and do some testing on. So if someone so over the summer we we wrote a C CUDA port of our existing Python code. So if you want to work on that, that's an option. Um, kind of things that you might need to know there is again C uh, CUDA is kind of nice, um, and CMake. Uh, we have a we have a particle filter that and that's built upon the C port. So that is something that needs to also be merged in. Um, OpenCV, linear algebra kind of are also nice to have for that. Um, and then there's the Cal Kalman filter. I actually have those swapped. It's the Kalman filter that needs the C and the particle filter that needs Python. So I actually have those two bullet points swapped. Um, but the particle filter needs Python, OpenCV, and linear algebra, and the, and the Kalman filter needs C, OpenCV, and linear algebra. Um, there is potential for publications there, working with the students who, who wrote the code over the summer. So um, you want to call out that while I say that these requires, these are more, more or less nice to have if you are motivated, if you are interested. I've had plenty of students do perfectly well coming in with very, with very low knowledge, prerequisite knowledge, who's been able to, to uh, provide substantial inputs. Um, so kind of the last slide is my contact information. Um, while this says just my email here, I've updated this power, the, the PowerPoint um, as well to include Slack and my name. But feel free to message me here, feel free to send an email, or feel free to message me at, at, at Chris Crutchfield on Slack. All right. Uh, my name is Peter Tuller, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the Fish Sense project. Uh, I've just got a few slides here, uh, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, the next one. Uh, yeah, so I just want to sort of give um, a large scale overview of the um, project and what we're and the problem that we're dealing with, um, which is this danger of overfishing. And you see in that graph there that overfished uh, populations, uh, fish stocks are increasing um, pretty dramatically over the past few decades. Uh, and some estimates uh, actually say that certain fish populations may be entirely wiped out by the year 2070, which would be pretty bad because as these populations become overfished, there's also more and more um, human populations that are becoming reliant on fish as a primary source of protein. Uh, and so the idea is that um, regulators, policymakers, uh, and fishery centers want to track and monitor fish populations and their health um, to understand uh, the status of fish stocks in the ocean um, and to understand the quality of fish that they're taking out, the number of fish that they're taking out, and make sure that they aren't um, fishing more so than um, the environment can, um, uh, can create more fish. Uh, but the problem is that the ocean is very large. Um, sensing underwater is very difficult. Uh, and so a lot of the methods that are currently being used are either crude, inaccurate, um, or not really scalable. Um, one such um, method you can see there in the bottom right um, from a collaborator at Scripps using a stereo GoPro camera um, to image fish, uh, but there are certain issues with inaccuracy there um, and it's difficult to um, uh, uh, process the data, especially for that. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so our project, our project FishSense, is um, we aim to create uh, this low-profile, inexpensive, and modular RGBD imaging device, uh, which you can see there on the right. Um, with this device, we can do fish detection, we can do length measurement, and we can do biomass estimation uh, for relatively cheap. And it's, um, as I mentioned, you know, low-profile, and we're able to integrate it into a number of different um, scenarios, number of different applications. Uh, it's all built around this Intel RealSense D455 camera, uh, which if you're not familiar with, with it, it is an RGBD camera. Uh, so it takes in uh, RGB images in color, and then it also has um, stereo cameras uh, in the infrared spectrum. 
and it has machine uh, machine vision algorithms built into the camera itself that'll process the frames together and actually return a disparity map without any um, overhead processing needing to be done on the user side. Um, so you end up getting with color and the disparity image, it maps them together automatically and you get a 3D view of the scene. So you can see that sort of in the bottom left there, um, these are some of the images. This is one of the images that we uh, collected when we went in, uh, we demoed and tested this device in the Birch Aquarium at, on UCSD campus uh, this past summer. Um, so we have the fish in the left side, and then we can see the fish clearly in the right in our, uh, in our depth image. Um, and then from that depth image, we can actually pick each point and find the 3D coordinate of the head of the fish and the tail of the fish. Um, and then ca um, calculate the length measurement. And then from length measurement with some um, knowledge about the species and the density of the fish, we can do a biomass estimation. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I just wanna go over the, um, the goals for the year. Um, this past summer, we've been doing a lot of data collecting and revising our system. Um, and so coming up, we are um, turning around, learning from the deployments that we've done in the past few months. Um, developing a new prototype and targeting additional deployments. Um, pretty much uh, a lot of a lot of revisits. Um, we're going to um, revisit the uh, nonprofit known as Reef. Um, they just did some tests uh, within the past few weeks. Actually, they were um, imaging some lionfish, uh, and we should be getting data back from that tomorrow. Um, we also are looking at uh, aquaculture, aquaculture being a fish farm. So instead of fishing in open ocean, they breed and raise fish in tanks in the ocean or large nets in the ocean and then harvest. Um, they have a particularly interesting problem that I think is um, the, uh, the one that makes the most sense for us to um, work on solving uh, in the short term uh, because they know how many fish they, they want to know how many fish they have. Um, so that they can regulate their feed. We're not having to go into the open ocean to find various fish populations and, and stocks. We're able to, uh, we know where to deploy and how to deploy. Um, and these are some images from um, Pacifico uh, that we have recently received. Um, so you can see we've been working on our detection algorithms to um, identify the fish in the image um, and, um, and, and outline them uh, as part of a pre-processing step. And so we want to move on to uh, length measurement from there. Uh, I've also been talking about doing uh, deployments in Jamaica. This is um, using the fish sense camera, uh, not as a handheld device, um, but rather as a camera trap uh, where we can deploy it for weeks at a time and gather data about uh, the mangrove forests there. Um, other goals for this year, um, working on a journal of oceanic engineering paper, um, targeting our uh, detection algorithm and pre-processing algorithms. Um, so, uh, and using, um, not just doing detection in color images, but also doing detection in depth images as well, which is something exciting. Um, and has been, um, yeah, uh, is, is definitely the next step forward for this project. Um, and then finally, we're also this quarter and next quarter, um, we're involved with the Start Blue Accelerator. Um, this is something that we've done in the past. We've worked with um, industry mentors to um, develop fish sense and to develop a pitch for it as a startup. Um, we haven't incorporated or anything like that, but it's something that we're interested in exploring. Um, and it's certainly opened up a lot of interesting collaborations for, um, for us, uh, particularly with Pacific Aquaculture, um, where it's, and so we're excited to work more on it, talk to more people within the industry and get a, a better understanding of how to actually tackle this problem of fisheries management. Um, so it's a number of goals, but they all kind of, um, you know, relate and work into each other. Um, and, uh, but a lot of it is based on this uh, machine learning uh, and improving our detector um, that we've been working on. Uh, so we can go to the, go to the next slide, which I think says exactly what I just said. Yeah, so um, primarily looking at improving our, our detector. Um, so comfortable programming with C++ or Python. Um, so that's what we've been um, developing in Python for the detection, C++ for working with the actual hardware itself. Um, ML computer vision experience, um, technical writing, that's we're definitely looking to um, publish. Uh, we have uh, I mentioned the Journal of Oceanic Engineering um, publication, but there's also a few others that we're, um, that we're looking at. And um, that's something we've done before. I just actually presented this work at Oceans uh, 2021, the conference which was down the street, literally five minutes from my house in San Diego. So I had to travel very far for that conference, but um, there are other conferences that maybe we could travel farther for. 
Um, and then also the business experience and entrepreneurship. Um, it's something I'm definitely interested in and passionate about and a couple of the people on the team are. Um, so if you are interested, that's a, that's a cool way to get involved as well. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, I'll pass it back to, to Nathan, I believe. Should I do this, Nathan? I will do this then, I think, huh? Uh, so uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, the presentations. These awesome projects. Um, I, I enjoy seeing them every time uh, I, I have, we have these presentations. There's so, so many cool things that we're doing. Um, so if you are interested in getting involved, um, there are the links here. Um, maybe someone can do me a big favor and put those into the chat so it make them a little bit easier uh, to, uh, to click on. Um, but we, uh, we, we get a good number of uh, people and we like to make sure that you're going to be successful and going to be um, make some contributions and capable of making contributions to the projects. Uh, so we do uh, basically we, we take applications. So we're going to uh, have applications. The, the links are open. So please go ahead and fill that out. Um, the, uh, um, the applications will be open for a couple of weeks and, uh, we're going to be then deciding, uh, uh shortly after that. Uh, so definitely, but definitely fill those out, um, uh, sooner rather than later. So you don't forget about them. And if you have any sort of questions about any of the different projects, the student needs are the best people for those projects, um, uh, for answering questions about those projects. And if you have any questions, just generally speaking about the Engineers for Exploration program, you can contact me, Ryan Casper. My email is there. Uh, Kurt Sugars, the other uh, the other uh, professor that is uh, um, director of this program, and uh, we, I'd be happy to discuss with you any sort of uh, higher level issues uh, or not issues, but uh, um, any sort of higher level things that you'd want to know about the program. Um, you know, potentially getting research credit, if you can get paid, those sort of things. Um, which are definitely all possible um, uh, in the future as you evolve through the program. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, it was a great uh, pleasure of mine to see all these projects uh, again, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I will stick around here for a few more minutes if you have any other specific questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, please uh, sign up and uh, we look forward to, uh, to uh, seeing you at uh, future meetings. Bye-bye. Yeah, so there's a question in there um, about uh, applications for later. So this program runs all year round, actually. Um, we do a kind of a big push, push for recruiting, uh, obviously in the fall, because that's the time that a lot of students are looking uh, to get into uh, something new and something different. Um, but we certainly will be having other recruiting pushes uh, typically at the beginning of every quarter. Um, so if you're interested in starting a little bit later, uh, you can do that. That is definitely a possibility. Uh, I would suggest to make that very clear in your application or just wait until apply to, uh, to some other uh, in the future when you're, when you're ready to, uh, to, to do that. Oh, hi, hi, uh, data science capstone. No, you definitely don't have to apply for that. So uh, we'll be talking about this uh, next next week, I believe, next Monday in your in your normally scheduled class uh, about which projects and uh, what opportunities there are for the program. Hi there, Ethan. Are there any limits to the number of projects to apply for? Um, no, I don't think so. You should definitely mention all the ones that you're interested in. And I would encourage you to talk to uh, the mentors, the project mentors, the project leads uh, about those projects that you're interested in to get a better feel for what specifically you would be doing in those projects. 
Uh, sometimes the projects sound uh, super amazing at the highest level, meaning you know the, the application of it is, is really compelling to you. And, and, um, but the stuff that they're doing maybe technically is not as interesting to you as another project. Um, so definitely reach out to those project leads and uh, they, I'm sure they'll be happy to discuss with you about the opportunities in their group and how they manage their group. Every project kind of works a little bit differently depending on how the leads want to organize it. And, um, and that will give you a much better feel, I think, for which projects uh, would be the best fit for you. Because we want to put you into a project that you're going to be successful in, uh, and that you're going to enjoy, and that you're going to work on, uh, spend a lot of time on, make a lot of great results, go into the field, and deploy these technologies for us, and uh, become a student lead in, in a year or two. So is there any way to participate without a much coding knowledge? Um, there are, depends on what your skills are, yes. Um, so we've had um, a lot of some people, for instance, that you know, do really good, uh, we do a lot of videos and things like that. So if you're good at editing, things like that, we can put your skills to work. Um, some of the projects are less coding based, like the, um, uh, like the virtual reality, the Maya archeology span project. Um, that's a lot of software, but not necessarily, not necessarily coding. So it's more artistic as, as Giovanni sort of implied in his, his discussion. Uh, so that would be an example where you should say, here's my skills and here's what I would like to do. And we can try to figure out the, the, best, project, um, the be best project for you. Or you can learn the skills. So it's also definitely possible. Don't be afraid if you don't have certain skills um, because you can learn them if you're, going to, if you're willing to put in the time. Um, that's the, the biggest thing about any sort of research project. You're not going to be have the perfect skills for any of them, but you, if you have the willingness to, to learn those skills, then you're going to be, you can be a very, uh, very valuable part of the team. Yeah, don't be, um, don't be intimidated. I saw Chris's message in the chat but just definitely don't be intimidated it's very easily to be easy to be intimidated um, by all these cool projects but these projects a lot of them are going for five or even ten years so the results that you're seeing are things that uh, have sort of accumulated over a decade so uh, uh, you can make a contribution for sure if you're willing basically just to put time and, and, and effort into the projects Okay, people are either not around or waiting for other people to ask questions. Uh, but again, feel free to reach out to, uh, to me, um, to Kurt, uh, to Nathan, or any of the project leads, and we'd be more than happy to discuss uh, opportunities with you further. Uh, thanks again for attending, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.